Okay. Um, I hope you have your questions in mind. I guess we're going to have some microphones uh, set up. They're coming. Um, we're going to ask you to come down and ask your question with the microphone because we're recording the um, session uh, for archival purposes. So don't you don't have to go change before you come down or anything like that. Um, and so uh, the speakers are invited. Let me invite the speakers to come and have a chair up here. Um, and uh, and I will I will call on people from up here, and uh, we have time for. Those questions as well. And since they're all here, uh, I think we should just give another round of applause. <laughs> I've rarely been a part of a, such a tightly, tightly organized and well organized uh, symposium. I think you've gotten a lot of. So let me invite you, the floor is open, uh, and come down and ask the question. Come in. My name is Lauren Rakin from New York University. I've had uh, some experience with NAGPRA, uh, in fact that two of my students did their master's thesis on it and working with Elizabeth Sackler and her organization. And I'm wondering if the Native American Graves Patrimony Repatriation Act has how, how if at all, it's an impacted on this museum. And I mean, since, well, either past when it was at 155th Street and then in this location. And you want to begin? Maybe you're the you're the staff person here, or we also have historians of this process. So. Are these on now? Yes. Okay, so I have to hold the button down, I guess. Um, how has it affected? I mean, we could we could talk all day about the progress of work in terms of repatriation and research on our collections that assist the return of human remains and sacred objects and objects of cultural patrimony. Um, I cannot, off the top of my head, give you statistics on those things. There are other people in the room who could do so. Um, David, you're sitting right behind this gentleman. Um, on, on our website, our repatriation department has innumerable pages which, are, which both provide information on the background of the museum's repatriation department and also the processes that tribes are asked to go through in making claims on those objects. Um, that also is available in a printed guide, I believe, or it will be at some point. Um, in terms of the original Museum of American Indian, the return of the water buster bundle objects is the only instance of repatriation that I'm familiar with from the period before the museum became part of the Smithsonian Institution. There may have been s minor things that were not claimed or were not publicized or anything else, but I've never run across them. I suppose it's fair to say also, just in, in light of what uh, Professor Deloria was just speaking about, is that the passage of NAGPRA and its administration over the past 20 years represents a shift in those power relations that were so distinctively a part of 1916 and have shifted in the 21st century. I think maybe that's a fair general statement, and, and there's lots of detail behind that. Please. My name is Ursula Hahn. Um, I must say I'm overwhelmed uh, by the, the broad range of expertise presented this afternoon. It's absolutely mind-boggling. Uh, mind I do have a question uh, concerning one matter which uh, Professor Sneed alluded to, uh, and that is the employment of Native Americans uh, for the excavations. 
Um, I think he called for uh, people with um, a PhD thesis working on this uh, subject. But what is known at this time? How many uh, of Native Americans were employed, or roughly? Uh, were they forced? Were they willingly participating? Uh, were they paid well? if some, something like this existed at all. Um, is it known what they felt about their work? Personally, I talked a little bit in the, in the break. Um, and of course, this is, is, as she says, this is why I think that someone should write this up, because it's a, there's a lot, of, a lot of really interesting information. But most of the questions that, that she looks for us to answer, or for someone to answer, um, we can't yet, I'd say. Um, we are hearing their voices translated through anecdotes, in a sense. So that the, the incident that I mentioned, Jesse Fuchs, who's working at the Pueblo of Awadabi in Hopi country, um, just sort of candidly talks about when we were excavating in this particular place, it was a source of distress to our workers who stopped. And there was some discussion, and then the project went along in some other way. But it's, it's, it's thrown off as kind of an anecdote. So it's not, in a, in a sense, a, a serious story, except there's a serious story there. We just don't know what it was exactly. So these kinds of things are sometimes preserved archivally in curious ways. I have done some work in the Edgar Lee Hewitt papers, which are in the Museum of New Mexico. And Edgar Lee Hewitt was, could be a, a whole other symposium. He's a contemporary of, of, of these folks, but from the New Mexico side, he's the founder of the Museum of New Mexico. And there is, is correspondence in his papers from some of the Native Americans, particularly at, at uh, Santa Clara Pueblo, San Alfonso Pueblo, that worked with him. But I don't think anyone's ever gone through those to see what exactly was happening. So. So, if anyone else has something they want to add to this? I can add some things. I mean, there's, um, I think one answer to the series of questions is, is that I'm not sure that there is a single answer because each one of those archeological ex excavations or situations had its own relations. So where Hewitt's might be one thing, if you look at the papers of Frederick Webb Hodge for Hawiku, there, some of those papers do actually include a time card for what the, week, the month, weekly or monthly wages were paid to Zuni workmen at Hawiku. Um, Hodge also um, talks at length about how the native workers were indispensable because there was no way that he and the archaeological members of that expedition could ever have made sense of what they were finding. It was only through Zuni workmen providing knowledge and interpretation while the objects were being excavated that allowed any interpretation to be made at all. So there's it's a huge panorama of possibilities about the relationships inherent in those things, some of which were probably quite bad and others were probably entirely voluntary and actually um, provided information because in some of the Zuni cases, they were seeing things that they had heard about but never had actually seen during their lifetimes as well. Thank you. It's also just a small footnote is that the, that the question was about archeology span but in the world of cultural anthropology and cultural field work, Boaz and Lowe and, and uh, field workers to this day have native collaborators and, and have worked with native people and that, that's an area that has been fairly well. Uh, add one footnote to that as well and this is totally tangential, but while this is all going on, th there are lots of people out in the west with shovels uh, and I'm thinking particularly of the paleontologists who are out in especially Montana, Wyoming, Colorado and sometimes encountering native groups in hostile ways, sometimes not, a, we, we, this is a whole other area we don't really know much about, but, but the West is seen as a kind of bonanza of artifacts in the, you know, the post-Civil War period. And many of those dinosaurs, of course, wind up here in New York um, at the American Museum. Okay, yes. Hi, I'm Howard Teach, I'm on the New York board of the museum. And as I was listening here, I became curious if for the next few minutes, you all became George Gustav High. 
And he was watching over now the past hundred years, hearing this today. What would be his closing comments? What would be his sense of this? And what would be his dream? I need a cigar. <laughs> if, you, if you could each comment on that, being Gustav, George Gustav, hi. Well, uh, uh, sure. Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, you know, I think that, uh, and, and Fred made allusion to this, I think one of the things that NAGPRA has done, I think inadvertently, is to reinvigorate these collections and the institutions that hold them of native material. I think by the time George Gustav Hyde died, there was a kind of, uh, that world had become a little bit moribund. Uh, and you can go to some of these museums and realize the exhibits haven't been changed since the 1960s. And I think in the last, let's call it quarter century, give or take, um, there has been a whole new kind of energy that's come into these things, which I think would have made him pretty enthusiastic. Let me echo this. Um, we, we have a, a vision, I would say, of in the 50s and the 60s, many of these major institutions were, were very, very marginal. So between High's work, uh, look at the work of, of, of uh, Charles Lummis at the Southwest Museum in California. Um, with, the, with the deaths of their founders, they were teetering for a very, very long time. So I think while they might be impatient with some of our cavils about what they did, I think they would be pleased that this is still a subject to engage, particularly because at the time that they were wrapping things up in their old age, that may not have seemed to be, have much future to it. For some reason, Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court is actually kind of the <laughs> <laughs> Is this on? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I think he would be very surprised. But the thing that occurs to me too is that what we haven't, of course, is not part of the scope of this discussion, but it should be perhaps stated, is that because of these collections and their ability to, um, to be teachers, to be resources, there has been an extraordinary revival of uh, traditional art forms. There's also, of course, fabulous contemporary art. But if you just think about basketry or uh, Kwakwakiwa carving or Robert Davidson or somebody like that, the level of artistry that people reach now surpasses much of what is in museums. And I think that, you know, I hope I didn't come across as too negative about High, because I think he did have a great appreciation of the, of the beautiful. And I think he would be, I think he would have been very pleased by that. Um, I don't know if I can pretend to be George High. Um, <laughs> um, despite having been, you know, sort of steeping myself in thinking about whatever. But there's two things that come to mind, though, which is, that um, when High's collection was exhibited at Penn, when it first opened in 1910, he wasn't there. He just wasn't, he did not attend. When the Hudson Theater opened, he stepped into the background. He did not really like people looking at what he did, apparently, or talking about him, or doing any of those things. But if there's one thing I could say, if he, were, if he were here and what he would say about, for instance, the collection becoming part of the Smithsonian, I can only guess that he would say, as long as, it's not, as long as it did not become part of the American Museum of Natural History. <laughs> because, because if there was anything in his life that he did not want to happen, it was that his collection be swallowed up by M and H. So that's what I think he would say. <laughs> Uh, like everyone else, not so easy to channel a person um, <laughs> like this. Um, but I think, I, you know, I mean, how could he not be pleased, right? I mean, um, you know, NMAI is a, is a fantastic national cultural resource. It's gone far beyond sort of a local person. And, you know, I know people in New York don't think you're local, but, you know, kind of are. But, um, <laughs> But you know, it, it's gone far beyond um, what it was into becoming something that is national and international in its quality and character. And I think the way that we've actually framed our discussion of him, I would like to think, to, you know, this quote I think is quite wonderfully chosen. Right? These are not ob simply objects to me. 
Right? These are sort of vistas and dreams that carry possibilities for the future. I mean, that's a very forward-looking kind of possibility for him, both forward and backward-looking, right, in some ways. And, you know, so I, how could you not be happy if you were him? I, I think he'd be honored and, and pleased. Please. Good afternoon. My name is Constance Diggs, and I am from Nyack College. And I'm just thankful that you invited me here today. We've held events here similarly, and it's just always good to be connected to our community institutional neighbor. My question is for Philip and Ann. And I want you, if you could, address, and I guess because you're the 3,000 mile perspective, that's how far up you said, right? And Ann, you're here with the museum. Can you speak to how historic witness and perhaps language and literature and ceremony has now, I guess, connected the dots and will continue to connect the dots of how we continue to study this very rich culture. And I'm going to make my upstairs. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that question. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to connect all, all the things that were in that question is how, so like you said, how does his- I would like, if you could, speak to how, I guess during the timeline, there's been a lot of timeline here right. today, reaching back and reaching forward. So how has the role of historic witness, the study of language and ceremony, and if you have literature played into this, and how will it feed the future? But I'm not sure I understand what you mean by your, your use of historic witness. Perhaps someone who was a ba an actual basket weaver or someone who was actually sewing or someone perhaps who was part of the excavation who was indigenous. Mm -hmm. I don't really, I'm drawing a blank on how to answer, think, that, answer that question I, in the I, time I, available. I, I, think it's, I think it's part of a, um, you know, what's, what's interesting here, right, is to move from the early 20th century where so much of the kind of cultural infrastructure of meaning that's built around this stuff is about no historic, no, not futurity, right? Historical witness only in the sense of, um, you know, kind of nostalgic kinds of uses perhaps. Um, you know, the reclamation of 19th century history in the early 20th century is not really a pretty thing for Indian people, right? Because it's all about battles and wars and this kind of stuff. It's not good. But if we stand at the, at, you know, a hundred and some years later, I mean, I think what you see is a really different kind of cultural structure, you know, not just in terms of the United States, but in terms of American Indian people themselves, right? And so that's about the active agency of Indian people over the course of the 20th century to bear historical witness, right? To call up the past, to constantly renegotiate and renavigate that, to jump into politics in the broadest kinds of frames, right? To be active, right? To take from other kind of social justice movements that are floating around out there. I mean, it's no coincidence that we're all focused right now on North Dakota, right? And, and, and some part of that, I think, also has to do with some of the things that you also have asked us to think about, ceremony, mm -hmm. spirituality, um, the aesthetic, the literary, those kinds of things. I mean, one could really argue that from the, the multiple strands of sort of Indian revitalization, you know, from mid-century on, there's a political one for sure, but writing, literature, art, those kinds of things, which are many cases, as folks have already said, right, completely linked to the possibilities that are created by these, these collections. Those things, you know, um, this is clearly a case, right, where artists are out front and writers are out front thinking about stuff, drawing on paths and recreating um, kinds of things. So, so it feels to me, uh, like over the last 50, 60 years, what we've really seen is a range of reclamations, you know, around those things, that this collection's been part of it, and that NMAI actually sits right now as a kind of living symbol of all of that kind of stuff. And certainly one of the challenges and opportunities for the university, university, sorry, I'm coming to university. <laughs> I'm a former administrator. I just fall into that kind of language. One of the challenges for the museum, right, is, and opportunities, 
is to build that connection out and always make those things. And that's a fundamental part of the mission of the museum itself, right, is to be there present in Indian country for those kinds of things. And that's the reason why I asked that question, because as a patron and even as an institutional neighbor, every time I've come in the doors, it's so much bigger of an experience rather than just looking at images. I feel like you guys have tapped into historic witness because there's voices and music and ceremony going on. So. Thank you. I think what, if I could just add one thing is that I think this museum has actually had two foundings. Uh, we've focused today on the founding in, in, uh, in 1916, but as a member of the original NMAI Board of Trustees, that very much felt like a founding as well, and it had to do with infusing the institution with the kind of spirit that Phil just was, uh, was talking about. That's a subject for another symposium, but I just had to add that. Please. My name is Marjorie Lindblom. Thank you for what you've uh, told us today. What does what you have spoken about tell us about what the museum is doing and should be doing in terms of its current collections? And in particular, does it mean that the museum now, going forward, becomes just an art museum? Or is there a role beyond that? I, I certainly don't think that NMAI is an art museum. I think that there are, I mean, if you remember back to some of the, one of the quotes that I showed about the, the sort of panorama of aspects and the, and the words that were used to describe the collections, which were aesthetic, historic, literature, things of value, is that I think there's always a recognition that that the collections or what the museum was had a number of facets. And over time, they have been appreciated in various ways. I think one of the ways that um, has been something of a disadvantage over decades, probably 40 or 50 years, is that the museum's information about the collections was essentially buried and separated from it, which allowed only an appreciation of the aesthetic so that a stick was a stick and a beautiful basket was a beautiful basket. So we were limited only to what people could actually see. Um, we have been doing a tremendous amount of work in terms of researching those collections to actually put together documents and other information and to connect that information with what comes also from descendants of their makers and members of those same communities in today's terms. So we're talking about the sort of the recreation of a rich tapestry that allows people to look at the collections. If they enter with an artistic perspective, they can do that. If they want to enter with a historical perspective, they can see that too. So the point is to actually broaden the points of intersection that people have with objects and collections, whether they're archives, photos, physical objects, or whatever, as opposed to leaning too far toward any one of them. Right, I, I see that for what the for the collection you already have. I'm curious about what you see at the museum doing going forward. With in, current, in terms of collection, in terms of collection, yes, collection. collection. Yeah. yes, yeah. exactly. How about some of the other panelists have thoughts on that? Well, uh, so, so that someone who's written about whether whether museums yeah, need whether objects at all. Yeah, whether they need objects at all. Sure. <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure. I heard Phil say when he was when you were rattling off the, the various kinds of Indian reclamations that have been going on, uh, Native American history as, uh, as, as, as an accomplishment, as a really extraordinary accomplishment of, so now I'm gonna speak as a historian in the history department, uh, of my colleagues over the last two generations of people who, when this museum was opened 100 years ago, were, were simply assumed not to have a history, now do have a history. Now, so, so what, uh, what connects that observation to your question, it seems to me, is that this museum uh, has this extraordinary potential as a historical document or as a, as a series of historical documents. How do we use this collection to continue the, the work of creating Native American history, of, of using material objects? Historians are pretty wedded to paper. Um, we're not trained really well to use three-dimensional things to tell stories in the way that we do. We're, we go to archives and, and that sort of thing. So 
far from, you know, before we start collecting more stuff, it seems to me that the res the historical resource represented by the collection as it already is, is pretty extraordinary from a historian's point of view. Figuring out ways to get historians engaged with it, um, I think is a, is a challenge, because as I said, most of my colleagues who do native history or not native history don't use objects much at all in their work. Just a quick thought, if I, if I may feel. Okay, um, I I occupy a kind of a funny spot in this because the, particularly at the time that the NMAI was founded uh, was an era when relationships between native peoples and archaeologists in particular were quite fraught. Um, and it was the perception of people from my side of the academic community that that challenge was wrapped up in the NMAI and that, that the institution in its, in its earlier days, had, it had all these archaeological things, but, but it was hard to understand what to do with all that stuff because, because what they represented to much of the Native community was, was traumatic in a variety of ways. So one of the challenges I would see, and I don't know how this would work out, and, and Anne has done some things to push this along and, and some other kinds of things, is to address that challenge and address the challenge of what do we do with these, these collections that bring up kind of mixed emotions on their, their historical legacy, shall we say, but how they were acquired, what they meant, um, and, and what to do with them is a challenge in the relationship between um, native folks and, and archeologists that, that has evolved to a certain extent since the 90s, but um, has some more room for growth. So I'd love to see that being part of the mission going forward. Hi, I'm Catherine Lavender, and I've, we've heard a couple of mentions of the American Museum of Natural History versus the NMAI. And if you look at it in this contemporary moment, it's very easy to see a difference between the two in the way that the NMAI presents people with history and future, whereas the other one is sort of pinned with a pin like an insect. But I'm interested in that 1915 moment. So we have Boaz saying it's just going to replicate the NMAI, I mean, the Museum of Natural History and the response from High that it's actually gonna be different because different people will come and different people will use it. But I'm wondering about curatorial presentation. Was there really any distinction between the way that the Museum, museum of Natural History would have presented the objects and the way that High and his museum presented those objects for the visitor, from the side of the visitor? Um, I, I can answer certainly a part of that. One of, the, one of the major differences between the growth of anthropology as it came about at the Smithsonian, the American Museum of Natural History, the Field Museum, and everything else, was in the use of dioramas and posed human figures and sort of the creation of action and adding sort of layers of cultural information in various ways on top of the objects. And those were common to um, AMNH and to those other museums. Um, the Museum of the American Indian did not do those things. When we, I showed those, you know, static objects in static cases that remained the pattern of the museum probably through most of the 50s. The one device that the museum did use beside that was models, a model village or a model of an archeological site or something else like that. So there were distinct ways that the museum sort of parted company. And I think that one of the things that I've said about George High before is that at that point when he fires his staff because he can't afford them anymore, he kind of stops thinking. I mean, he really, he has no influence. He doesn't have anybody to talk to anymore. And he, his like thought process about what is possible in terms of the museum, in terms of the collection, it really stagnates horribly because of that. Because he's kind of alone, he's in his own head. I mean, he's got some guys who work with him, but they're more like caretakers, they're not, intellectual peers or anything else like that. So as other museums move into different forms of exhibiti exhibitry and interpretation, that doesn't happen with George High and the Museum of the American Indian. I had just add something. I, th I was thinking, uh, listening to all the papers too, that one big difference that maybe hasn't been brought out enough is that uh, uniquely the Museum of the American Indian only focused on the Americas. And these other big museums, not only American Museum of Natural History, not only did it focus on world ethnology, so Africa, Pacific, et cetera, it also focused on natural history. 
And I think, you know, I'm curious, because I don't know nearly as much about the museum as, as others here do, um, to what degree, I'd love to know more about George High as an American patriot, in a way, or as a, a sort of a, a sense of American, Americanness and American identity. Because in the period after World War I, I think both in Canada and the US, um, this enormous disillusionment with Europe and the mess that it had made generated a sense of uh, new confidence and new nationalism in North America. And there you have the Amer Museum of the American Indian just focusing on the complicated issues of identity and settler and indigenous identity. But nevertheless, that's its only focus. And there's no dinosaurs in there. So it's a, kind of a question, but I, I, I think it's also part of the just about the end of our time. We have one more question. We're just going to have time for one more question. If you had a quick comment you want to make. It's a long comment, so I'll, I'd rather. But we'll have, and we'll have time for discussion afterwards when we have a reception. So please, go ahead. Thank okay. you for waiting. Um, my name is Sandy Yelke, and I'm a native New Yorker. So I was fortunate to start visiting Audubon Terrace in the 60s when it was a very scary place, as I said to Dr. McMullen. Um, but the question I have is, to, to a certain extent, a follow-on. Um, I do outreach in the, at the University of Wisconsin, science outreach in the summer, and we have kids from the reservations. There are a lot of reservations still in Wisconsin, and those kids really need science classes. Um, they don't get very good things in the BIA school, and I want to ask how you guys and the museum interacts with that. It would be terrific to develop curricula. We try to develop curricula that are socially relevant, including science and materials. I've done courses in materials culture. I'm a materials scientist. So I wondered if that was something that you know, any of you were considering or how to do that to make you know, those objects relevant. There's a lot of interesting science in those objects. And curricula based on that, if you work with the BIA or the BIE at all on any trying to do any of these things. And, and I was just going to give an answer, which is the last time I went to um, Audubon Terrace, there had just been a repatriation in the state of New York. And there, they had pictures of the exchange the tribe in the state of New York had given. I can't remember which of the um, Iroquois tribes it was had given something to the museum in exchange for the objects they'd gotten back. So there was one and that would have been the middle 80s, I guess, or late, not late 80s. There was, there was, there was one. Um, the repatriation of Erica Wampum out, um, and then certainly the tribes people gave other pieces back. Um, in terms of your question, the museum is, um, and dir our director, Kevin Gover, is here somewhere unless he went home sick could speak directly to your question about doing more and more in terms of, of education. In terms of native science and education, though, I think it's a tremendous field that more and more people are getting into in terms of um, looking at some of these objects. I mean, a lot of the pieces that, that Ruth was talking about in terms of salvage anthropology and people studying native medicines and collecting all of this information, it's there in museum archives and collections to be understood and to be researched and brought back into use if it can be actually made useful for today's populations, whether it's the education of tribal students or the world. I think it's a great note to end on. Well, once again, I think we should thank our speakers. You're all welcome to join us and continue the conversation with our speakers as well. So thanks again for coming.